Good morning. Good to have you all here this morning. What my wife was doing was putting a button amongst my, my uh, uh, little uh, mints up here. If you remember, I told you I could take one of my cough drops and time about 20 minutes. She put a button up there. <laughs> so we'll see how, if I pick up the button by mistake, okay? <laughs> take a moment to look at your bulletins. We've got several things that I want to make aware to you. First of all, you've got a calendar in there. Notice all the open dates. Almost every one of our fellowship meals have been canceled. Because of this COVID situation, a lot of the class parties have been canceled. Please, when you get a calendar, don't get on to Sheila because something was wrong because this is the information we have of the date we printed the calendar. If something changes, then we haven't got it in the calendar on time. And we'll announce from the pulpit if there is a change. So right now, this is as far the best no, uh, information that we have. So please look at that. Notice there's no services on Wednesday night or on Sunday night until uh, after December, and then we'll relook at it in January to see where we are. Uh, we had some hopeful possibilities of a vaccine coming out uh, before the first of the year. We hope so. We hope that happens. Uh, but a good question was asked me, how do we know what's in it? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take me a magnet with me. And if there's any kind of metal stuff in that, it ought to pick it up and pull it right to the syringe. We'll find out one way or another if there's a chip in there or not. You can also take a cattle prod and destroy anything that's inside there. <laughs> <laughs> the electric shock will take care of it, believe me. <laughs> All right. Lottie Moon Christmas offering is uh, going on starting this, uh, this week and going through December. Of course, all of our mission uh, giving is going through December. We will divide it up amongst our, our groups uh, at the end of the year and send them all to them that way as we have normally been doing. Uh, then notice the different things that are happening this week. Uh, a lot of ha things going to be first of December, folks. We're, we're in it. We're the end of the year is to, uh, coming in close. Tomorrow is the last of, of November, and uh, we're getting into 1st of December. Uh, by the way, while I'm at it right now, I was just looking down here at the prayer list. Richard called and said that he's doing better, uh, so he is uh, recuperating at uh, uh, St. Mary's Rehab. Uh, he's able to move uh, uh, his arms and legs now, the, the left side was the one that was affected, and he's uh, recuperating, and uh, I think he's watching this morning, so everybody want to say a hi real quick to Richard, say hi. Hi, Richard. So maybe he heard us all, I hope. All right. Then uh, uh, please keep in mind that there's uh, several things going on this morning. As you came in, you should have picked up the Lord's Supper, okay? Now, I know this is different than what we do before. You know, we've had to readjust some things. On the top of that, if you'll notice, there is uh, one little layer that you pull that first layer off, and there's the wafer. Then you pull the second, you break the second layer, uh, and then pull it off, and that's the juice. And then when you go out, there are some uh, waste cans on either side for you to drop those in as you go out little different way of doing it, and, uh, but we'll get back to the normal when we finally get all of this COVID stuff taken care of, okay? All right. Any other announcement that needs to be made this time? Ladies, I think some of you are coming up to decorate tomorrow and then all through the week. Uh, are we still taking, uh, bringing the poinsettias, ladies? Anybody would like to, to buy a poinsettia in memory of somebody? Yes, that's, I was thinking perhaps that was the case. Okay, yes, call Sheila and let her know who you're donating the, the poinsettias for. We usually put them along here in memory of some of our loved ones that won't be with us during this time because they've passed and gone on to the Lord. So, any other announcement? Well, i got a special gentleman that's going to come up this morning. Brother Ken, why don't you come? Young people, if you want to get up a little closer to the front, we'll let you come on up to the front pew because uh, Ken's got a little special message he wants to share with you. 
There we are. Does this work? Ah, sounds like it. Okay, good morning, everybody. Well, we're kind of sp Brother Howard, did you tell him I was doing magic today? There's not many people here. No, I didn't tell you. Okay, I thought, thought, maybe, you, I thought maybe they were staying away in droves here or something. <laughs> All right. Uh, Get set up here a little bit. That's set up. I'm ready to go. Uh, okay, good to see everybody here. This is a good-looking crowd, though. Um, Brother Howard asked me to come up and say a few words. I'm going to disappoint him. I'm going to say a lot of words. Uh, but uh, there, there are three words we use to describe God. They're omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. You know what those mean? We'll talk about them. Omnipotent. What's omnipotent mean? That's right. All-powerful. There, there's nothing that God can't do. He spoke everything into existence. There, the whole universe, he just said, light be, and light was. He spoke everything into existence. He is all-powerful. There's nothing he cannot do. Omniscient, second word. Omniscient, what does that mean? All-knowing, yes. You're not going to surprise God. He knows everything, past, present, future. He sees it all. You, you're not going to surprise him. He's, God is never going to say, boy, I didn't see that coming. He knows it all. And omnipresent is the third one. Uh, he's everywhere. You don't have to come to church to visit God. He's here. If you're at home in your room, he's there. You go to the top of the highest mountain, he's there. You go to the bottom of the ocean, he's there. Take a spaceship to Mars, he's there. Yes, he's everywhere. Now, the one I want to talk about most today, talk about all of them, uh, the one I want to concentrate on today is omniscient. What does that mean to be all-knowing? means you can't hide anything. You don't have any secrets from God. He knows everything before you know it. Now, in a little bit, I'm going to pick somebody from the audience here. to. Uh, you don't have to come up here, but I'm going to ask you to, th to think of a number. But let me show you what I got here first. Can you hear me if I don't have the mic? You know, I, hear, I see Niles in the back. Okay. Um, I have here, if it, if, if it wasn't for COVID, I would hate these out for examination, but I have... A set of cards here with numbers on them, numbers one through six. I'm going to mix them up a little bit here. Now I want someone. Easy. Ready. You, young lady. Uh, I want you to think of a number from one through six. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell me. Don't tell anybody. Don't whisper it to the young man sitting next to you. Don't write it down. Keep it in your mind. You are the only person in the universe who knows that number. Well, guess what? God knows that number, too. He knows what you're thinking. So, can't hide anything. The only person in the world that knows that number. Now, I want, I want you to look at these cards. I'm going to hold them up one by one. I want you to tell me if your number is on this card, okay? Is your number on this card? Yes. It is, okay? How about this one? Is it on that one? I'll get rid of it. Is it on this one? Okay. Is it on this one? It's not on that one. Is it on, is it on this one? Is it on this one? Okay. Now. You're the only person in the world who knows that number. You and God. Nobody else in here knows the number. Nobody could possibly know that you picked the number six. <laughs> but if I know that, you can be pretty sure that God knows it too. That's it. <laughs> the skin goes. We'll be talking about judgment today because we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And God knows what we do and what we don't do. He knows when we've been good. He knows when we've been bad. He's got his own little list. You know, Santa Claus has a list, evidently, that everybody says, of good and bad. God knows who we are and what we've done and it's time for us to think about our relationship with God. 
and how we deal with taking the Lord's Supper. He knows and we know. And we need to give, ask him to deal with us today before we prepare for the Lord's Supper. All right? Good morning, Crow Mountain Baptist Church. We're approaching Christmas time, which means that it's time for some Advent music. So that's what we're going to start with today. Please stand, and we're going to begin with Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Come thou long expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in some prayer please holy father we come before you thanking you for the opportunity of being in your house this morning we thank you for those that have been able to make it today because of bad weather and all this covid mess we just thank you for their presence we just ask lord your blessing upon us as we try to give you worship and praise in spirit and truth go with us now in jesus name do we pray amen amen let's continue worship this morning with o come o come emmanuel Come to thee, O Israel. 
Good morning. How are you? Uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to read from, uh, a psalm, uh, Psalm 71, verse 1 through 6. Uh, it's the title, God the Rock of Salvation. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 71, it says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to, to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. Amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Lord, we just uh, we come before you, Lord, and just are, are thankful that we have the the freedom and the privilege to come and, and worship together. We just pray, Lord, that you speak to us this morning through Brother Howard, Lord. We just pray that you be with him and the message that you've laid on his heart. We just thank you, Lord, for uh, blessing us with time with our family, and we just ask, Lord, for you to watch over us. And most of all, we thank you, Lord, for your son, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have a special music this morning from Miss Alice Ann. Good. 
Please stand. We're going to conclude worship this morning with In Remembrance.
Thank you, music team. Thank you, Miss Alice Ann, for the song that you sang. You know, God's blessed us with a lot of talented people in our church. <clears throat> and it's good to hear them when they sing. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, I want to do a brief message. That message is to make us aware of what God is doing when he brings about judgment. And we say, well, why does that have anything to do with the Lord's Supper? Well, if you look over in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Judgment is a part of the Lord's Supper. We, we miss that sometimes. We, we kind of think, you know, it's, it, it is a time to remember what Jesus did for us, but we have to remember that Jesus died on the cross so that we wouldn't face the final judgment. The judgment that you and I will face is a different kind of judgment. There's two, type, two judgment days. I want to talk about the judgment days today. The first judgment day that Christians will experience, will I believe, for us, will be after the rapture, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. And there will not be a judgment of our sins, thank goodness, but it'll be a judgment for what we have done according to the Lord in good or bad in the body. Do we sin when we're in the body? Yeah, we do. We make mistakes. We're human. Do we miss doing what God tells us to do? Yeah, sometimes we do. And that kind of judgment is going to determine our rewards in heaven. And those rewards, by the way, are not something we're going to keep for ourselves. It's going to be something that we throw at the Jesus' feet. I don't know about you, but I hope I can take a wheelbarrow load and just throw it at his feet. Because that's what Jesus means to me. He is most of all honored because of what he has done. And we need to give him that praise and honor every day for the fact that he died on the cross for you and I. In Acts, 17th chapter, that's the first verse that I want to refer you to. It's kind of the opening verse. We talk about judgment there. Truly, in Acts, I think it's the 17th chapter, verse 31, says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands, tell men everywhere to repent. Verse 31, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that your word teaches us concerning judgment. A judgment that will happen for Christians, a judgment that will happen for the lost in the world. But Lord, help us to understand that that judgment is a judgment that is already taken care of for Christians by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Help us, Lord, as we understand better how we would come before you and honor you as we do the Lord's Supper. Forgive us for our failings, Lord. Help us as we begin in this time of service. Let us honor you in all things. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, as I said, there are two events in the future that are certain. The coming of Christ for his people, which is the rapture, and the coming of a judgment day for the world. Here's some things that we need to notice about this judgment. First of all, it's certain. It's going to happen. There's no way of getting out of it. For the Christian, there's no way of us not standing before the Bema Seat of Christ. We're all going to give account of what we have done in his body. Which tells me, just as Ken showed, that God knows everything about us. He has the knowledge of all the things that we have done and will do. You know, the Bible tells, or, uh, there, there's a lot of times people are saying that when they were close to an experience of death, that they thought, saw their life flash before them. So all the things that they did. Well, you know what? That is a medical 
certainty. That is a medical certainty. Let me give you an example here that I come across while I was researching this. Dr. William Pinford, director of the Montreal Neurological Institute, said in a report of the Smithsonian Institute, your brain contains a permanent record of your past and is like a single continuous strip of movie film, complete with soundtrack. This film library records your whole waking life from childhood on. You can live again those scenes from the past one at a time when a surgeon applies a gentle electric current to a certain spot on the temporal cortex of your brain. The report goes on to say that as you relive the scene from your past, you feel exactly the same emotions that you did during the original experience. It's a certainty. We can remember all of our life. If we can, God can. I remember watching a movie one time in, in which uh, God was judging and there was a screen and the guy's life kind of went all the way across to, in front of us. And he looked up there and he says, wow, you know all of that, God? He said, and more. The truth is, God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. He knows who we are. He knows the deepest, darkest secrets that we have in our life. He also knows the greatest joys that we've experienced. He knows the day we were saved. He knows the day that we accepted him. He knows exactly what we've done since that day and what we've done with the gifts that he has given us. God is omniscient. He knows everything about us. In John, the fifth chapter, verse 23 and on, it says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all the judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall, come, and shall not come into judgment, but pass from life, uh, death unto life. So the judgment he's talking about here is not the final judgment. As Christians, we have already been judged, found wanton, and once we accept Jesus Christ, have been forgiven. Have been forgiven. The judge has passed the verdict. Because of my son, you're clean. How many of you all have ever been in a courtroom? How many of you all ever had to go up because of a traffic ticket or something like that? Yeah, a lot of us. What does the judge do? Well, if you're very lucky, like the one that did on me up in Chicago, he made us wait all till the end of the day. He judged everybody else. The first guy that came up, he looked at him and said, this is your first offense. Do not pass go. Do not get $200. Bailiff, take this man to jail. Talk about scaring you to death. In traffic court, he was taken to jail. Judged all day long on different people and finally came up to us the little guys that had just been our first offense and he raised our license and he said, do you see the staple mark in here? He said, that tells me that you've had a first offense. For this one, you're forgiven. But if I see this in here again with another staple mark on it, it's not going to be easy. We had grace that day. Folks, I want you to know we got grace through Jesus Christ and they are not judged. We are judged according to our works, not our sins. Secondly of it, the university of it. He will judge the world. He judges both the saved and the lost. The saved at the Bema seat. The lost at the great white throne judgment. That's when it takes place. He will judge the world because he has been given the right to judge the world. Thirdly, What's the basis of it? It will be a judgment of what we have done in the body according to 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. It says, therefore, to make it uh, our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men that we will be as well known to God I also trust as well known in your conscience. Well, what about those 
that are lost. In uh, J- Romans 2, 16, it says, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus according to my gospel. He's going to get serious. He's going to get serious and do- judge the secrets of men. That literally means that the secrets things that we have done will be known. And what we have done with Christ is going to be judged. What we have done with that relationship, what we have done according to who Jesus is. In uh, John 3, 8 through 18 through 21, it says, He who believes in him is not condemned. Okay? Right off the bat, he who believes in him is not condemned. We believe in Jesus, we're not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they may be done in God. That judgment is going to be severe, folks. People who have rejected Jesus Christ will one day be brought to trial. And their life will be shown before them. And all that they have done. And they'll probably try to make excuses during that time. Well, I didn't know. Nobody told me. Well, the Bible is very clear that everybody, by even looking at nature, can understand who God is. If they haven't misinterpreted nature and tried to apply something else. God says that everyone is going to be brought to a judgment of some type. As to which it is, we need to decide. Who will sit at the judge? Well, that first verse that we read told us that he, the son, is going to be the one who judges. When James I, king of England, is said to have tried his hand as a judge... But to have been so much perplexed when he had heard both sides that he abandoned the trade in despair, saying, I could get on some very well hearing just one side, but when both sides have been heard by my soul, I know not which is right. When a king can't decide between two matters, you wonder, should he be even the king? There was one king that was very wise, and that was King Solomon. That was what he asked for, was wisdom to be able to discern. But a lot of authorities don't understand, especially when they hear both sides. They can't decide. It won't be a problem for Jesus, folks. It won't be a problem. When they stand before the great white throne judgment, the Bible says that the books are open and then the book is opened. The books of the events of our lives, the books that speak about who we are, those are all opened. And then the book, the book of the Lamb of God. And the question is going to be, not so much what's in these other books, but is your name written in the book of life of the Lamb? Because that's where it's going to be decided according to Revelations 20 and 21. Right at the last part of Revelations 20, you'll see that those books, as they are opened, it is the one that is the Lamb's book of life that gives judgment upon those who have rejected him. Their names are not written there. The question we've got to answer is, is our name written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life? Who will sit as the judge? Jesus Christ. There won't be any excuses that can be made that day that will allow forgiveness at that point. Just judgment. And the issue is eternal. The judgment is eternal. It can't be changed. If Jesus would come at this moment, I want you to ask yourself this question. Would I go with him? Would I go home with him? I had to answer that question many years ago. I was already an ordained minister. And it was asked me the very same way. If Jesus would come at this moment, 
would you go to be with him? And I couldn't answer it. And I had to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, repent of who I was, to come into my life and to change me. That's what it takes to escape the final judgment. When I get to the Bema seat, all I can do is say, Lord, I've done what I've done. You are the righteous judge. I trust you. But I know that I will not be in the judgment seat or in the judgment of the great white throne other than as an observer where I've already made a decision as to who Jesus Christ is in my life. The question that I want to make for you today and ask you is this. Before you take the Lord's Supper, have you made Jesus Christ your Savior? Have you asked him to come into your heart and life? Have you walked by faith into that first step of baptism? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? As you take the Lord's Supper, as it said over there in Corinthians, you need to examine yourself. While we prepare to do so, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer, quietly, in our seats. and Take a moment to examine ourselves as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Father, as we begin this service to remember who you are, your son Jesus Christ, and what he did upon the cross, how it was decided long ago that he would die for our sins and be resurrected from the grave that we might have eternal life. Help us to remember as he gathered with his disciples that evening and shared with them his body and his blood that was going to be made as a sacrifice for all mankind. Well, it's this time of remembrance. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. Before we begin, as everyone received one of the cups, okay? I want to take those. First time we've done this, so let me give you a little instruction. The first little flap, which is clear, pull that off, and that exposes the wafer. I do not guarantee the texture or taste of this. Other than the fact that is what they supplied us. And he, and he said to him, you have said it, as Jesus asked if it was he. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. Take ye now and eat as a representation of the body of Christ. Now you remove the second flap to get to the juice. Carefully if I understand this because that glue sometimes sticks kind of hard. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Father, we thank you that we can observe, first of all, the bread that was used to symbolize your body. And now as we take the cup symbolizing your blood, let us remember what you have done for us on the cross of Calvary. Take you now and drink of it. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. But stand if you would. <coughs> okay. Jacob, would you lead us, please? Blessed be the tie tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds. 